Now, some of you may think, why are we going to all this trouble to use an enum? Why don't we use something simpler like a series of integer flags to represent the security levels in the application? Well, is this really the right thing? Can anybody see a potential issue if we take this approach to using simple integer flags to representing our security levels? What could be the problems with this approach? Well, one of the first things that we realize is that we are expanding the bounds of the possible values that our security level variable can take. So suddenly, rather than having security levels that are really discrete and from a finite set of values from an enum, we have an unbounded, essentially, series of values that are only bounded by the minimum and maximum integer values in Java. And that's a huge number of different values. So that immediately adds complexity to our code, particularly from a testing standpoint. If we want to know that this code does the correct thing at all times, we have to build code that suddenly tests all of these different integer values, maybe not every single one of them, but important boundary conditions for sure, and ensure that our code is operating properly. Now, do we really need all of those different integer values to represent all of the different levels of security in our application? Probably not. It's really unlikely that we actually need the full range of integers and that we really have that fine of a grain you know, uh, set of security levels in our application. So you can imagine this adds significant testing complexity. Simple code, it doesn't really matter if I use this integer value. It's not really going to affect my testing that much. I can look at this code and I can very easily decide which are the important boundaries to test. And therefore, it's not a big deal if we used an integer to represent our security level. Now, in this specific case, if this code never changed, and if you were the only developer working on it, maybe that would be the case. But the reality of the software engineering world is we work in teams. We work with other developers. And it's almost uh, uh, impossible to avoid the situation that developers end up stepping on each other's toes or using each other's code or modifying each other's code in ways that the other developers didn't expect. And so we have to be able to guard against that by effective testing and by effective testing so that we can refactor our code and continually improve it. And what would happen if a developer comes along and decides that they want to refactor our code and add a new security level or suddenly change the conditional logic so that it checks if the security level is high enough to add encryption or not. And suddenly, we might introduce a subtle bug where we're incorrectly checking the condition on that integer. And suddenly, our security level is not causing the data to be stored securely anymore, even though it was before. So without effective testing of a range of values, and continually updating our test cases to account for all of these different integer value ranges. And each time we add some significant value, we have to test around the boundaries of that integer. So it, it, it adds significant complexity to our code if we have these unbounded integers that we are trying to use for a security level. So we want to try to have representations of our security state that are bounded and easier to reason about. Another issue that we have to think about is what happens when somebody misinterprets the usage of an integer for a security level and provides a value that we haven't defined a security level for. In this code, all we've got is a max security level and then no security. But the actual security variable itself could be any integer so what happens if somebody provides us a random integer? What if they provide us 43 or 17? What does that mean? Or in this particular case, what if the person thinks that, well, I'm going to write even more secure code. So I'm going to take the most secure, highest security level that you've currently got, and I'm going to increment it. I'm going to make it one level greater of security. 
Well, what does that mean to us? And we've all of a sudden introduced complexity, the potential for people to misunderstand how our system works, and the possibility of dealing with values that we didn't intend to be provided to us from a security level perspective. So we want to be careful that we bound our security level state and be able to reason about it easily. And also, by bounding it, we make it easier for other users to comprehend the appropriate way to use that state and how to express what they want done and how securely they want it done. The other issue with this integer approach is it doesn't enforce any type of type constraint. And that causes a couple of problems for us. One of them is, suddenly, we would like to enforce some level of separation between the security state and the data state. We would like to make it hard to mix the two together and to set security state from some computation on the data state. But with the current approach in this code, I can do something odd, like I can assign the security level to the number of groups or the size of the private groups. So maybe my thought process, if I'm another developer, is, well, the bigger the group, the more I need to secure it, because the more damage could be done if those names got out. And if there's absolutely no one in the group, well, then that's fine. That means we have a security level of zero, because there's no point in securing it, because who cares if that gets out, because there's no data there. And the more people in the group, the more data is being exposed, so the higher the security level. So somebody could simply take what you're doing and misinterpret it and then begin calculating some security level based on their data state. And that's not really what we want them to do. So in this example down here, suddenly they're setting the security level equal to the size of the private groups, which is clearly not something that you intended for a user of your interface to do. So if we were smarter about how we designed our abstraction, we could add some typing to our security levels to ensure that we can enforce some levels of separation between the security state and the data state, or at least make it harder to um, mix and match the two directly. So if we go back and look at our enum approach again, we get a number of important benefits from this approach. The first benefit is that our our security state is clearly bounded. We only have two specific values that we have to worry about, security level max and none. There is no in-between, and there's no possibility to assign a value that's in-between. And this is really important because it helps us to prevent the errors that we saw of people misusing our interface to security. And it also is very important from a testability standpoint. It's much easier with this enum approach to figure out what are all the important values to test and then to go and build test cases that ensure that those test cases uh, guarantee that the security is upheld for each of the values that we care about in that enum. Another important aspect of this enum approach is that it takes many of these errors that we saw that resulted from misuse or misinterpretation of our security level and how we interpret that, that uh, type and push them into compile time errors. So if another developer is misusing our interface, many of the common ways that it might be misused could be caught at compile time as compile time errors. So for example, if we look at the first line, they're trying to assign an arbitrary value for which we don't have a definition of what that means in our security model. Three, what does three mean? We haven't defined that value. Well, now it's a compile error because if they assign three, three is an integer and our security level is an enum and you can't, those things aren't compatible. So that would be flagged at compile time as a misuse of that particular interface. So we've taken something that would have been a runtime error and caused sort of undefined behavior, and we've pushed it to a compile time error to prevent a security problem. If we look at the second line, they were mixing our security state and our data state together. 
they were trying to assign a security level based on the size of the private groups. So suddenly, we can push this to a compile time error as well, because directly assigning the security level from the groups and the size of the groups is not possible because private groups that size does not give you a security level, it gives you an integer. Again, a compile error because it can't be assigned to the security level. So we can help prevent people from mixing security and data state. Unless security state is somehow that type, security level is somehow represented in the data state, it's unlikely that they'll be able to easily mix and match the two. Or if they do, they'll be very aware of what they're doing. If we look at the third line, we can deal with the misinterpretation of the paranoid user who tries to increment the security level above our maximum because they're even more secure than everybody else. And again, this is being caught and flagged and turned into a compile time error. So by changing the design of our interface and using this enum, rather than an integer, we're getting a number of benefits from the ability to catch errors in how other developers are using our code. And also from a testability standpoint and our ability to maintain that code and ensure that it stays secure, particularly in a group software engineering environment where other developers are modifying the code as well. So is this as good as we can get this interface? Can we make these abstractions any better than they already are? Well, I think that we can. There's still more that we can do to improve these abstractions that we've built to store data securely. 